All right, welcome everyone. I'm Will Boast. I teach in the creative writing program here. I see many faces I recognize, but thank you all for coming tonight. And so we're very excited tonight to host uh, Laura Vandenberg. And uh, we'll have her up in just a minute, but just to say a few words about Laura's fiction, which I think is in the best possible way eerie. In her work, Wives and husbands, sisters and brothers become inscrutable, even alien to one another. Children are abandoned, loved ones die in mundane accidents close to home, or they go off to Antarctica, Patagonia, the Amazon, where bizarre misfortunes visit them, or as often, they simply seem to wander off the face of the earth. In her first novel, Find Me, which was long listed for both the Center for Fiction First Novel Award and the very prestigious Dylan Thomas Prize, a disease sweeps across the country, erasing people's memories. In her first story collection, What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us, which was similarly recognized by the Story Prize and the Frank O'Connor Award, a failed actress works as a Bigfoot impersonator, a botanist seeking a rare flower crosses paths with men hunting the Loch Ness Monster, and a missionary gets obsessed with a creature rumored to live in the forests of the Congo. And in a brilliant passage in one of my favorite of her short stories, Antarctica, from her second collection, the Isle of Youth, one character has long, heated phone conversations in French, and when their housemate delicately picks up the second line to listen in, no one's on the other end. Eerie. One of the overarching insights of Laura's work is that we all live adjacent to mystery. We're all detectives searching for clues about the lives of those most intimate to us, and at the same time, of course, trying to solve the perpetual riddles of ourselves. Laura's fiction, I think, beautifully wraps itself around genre tropes. Mystery, yes, but also magic realism, dystopia, sci-fi, and especially in her new novel, The Third Hotel, horror. And somehow in the process, it also reinvigorates these tropes, makes them unfamiliar, elliptical, unnerving. It's long been clear to me that Laura must read broadly and brilliantly because you sense not just the presence of a keen storyteller and beautifully measured prose stylist in her work, but also the presence of a careful and passionate student and critic of our literature. That's no more in evidence, I think, than in The Third Hotel, which, if you're counting, is her fourth book in five years. Incredible output. The Third Hotel subtly and intricately twines together elements of travelogue, Hitchcockian psychological suspense, and zombie movies into a disarmingly moving portrait of the mysteries of a marriage. And at the same time, it also manages the trick of being a critique of travelogue, a critique of Hitchcockian psychological suspense, zombie movies, and the mysteries of a marriage. Read The Third Hotel alone for its feminist critique of slasher movies, and you'll come away impressed. But more than that, Laura brings her literary instincts to bear on a story that finds the mysteries inherent even in the most seemingly ordinary moments in our lives. Our work, our families, the illnesses we must endure or must witness others endure, the reasons why we sometimes quite literally fling ourselves off cliffs, the ways in which we somehow return to ourselves and find new ways to claw our way forward. Laura has also been honored by the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Bard Fiction Prize, the McDowell Colony, the Pushcart Prize, and the O'Henry Award, among many other awards and recognitions. And her stories and essays have appeared in conjunctions, Kenya Review, American Short Fiction, Plowshares, Glimmer Train, Best American Short Stories, we're getting to the anthologies now. Best American Mystery Stories, the O'Henry Prize Stories, and the Best American Non-Required Reading, which, gee, Laura, are there any left, really? <laughs> this is my question. Her impressive publication record uh, has brought her into teaching uh, gigs at uh, the MFA program at Columbia, Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, uh, Breadloaf Writers Conference, and she now lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is a Briggs Copeland Lecturer in Fiction at Harvard University. We're very excited and proud to welcome tonight, Laura Vandenberg. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here this evening. I'm, I'm really happy um, to be in Chicago. And thank you, Will, for that like very thorough and, um, and very kind and generous introduction. And thanks to the Creative Writing Program for having me, and also Starsha for all that you did to make this visit possible. I'm going to read for about like 20 or so minutes. I always like to tell people how I'm going to, so like when I get going, you're not, you don't get nervous that this might last for like an hour or something. It won't. <laughs> I've seen readings like that and I feel like this, yeah, like low key reading too long PTSD is, compels me now to tell people how long I'm, I'm going to read for. So are there any horror movie fans in the room? 
<gasps> so exciting. Okay. Fans of what? Horror films? Oh. <laughs> maybe we'll maybe we will have turned you by the end of the event and i saw one hand in the back that sort of went like this wa wavering okay this, this this could be like the we might we might have some new recruits by the time um the evening ends so the section that i'm going to read from comes fairly early in the book so there's not a lot you need to know um but as will, will gave a great description of the novel um but just to recap it it concerns a couple named claire and richard and Richard is a horror film scholar who's killed in a hit and run car accident under mysterious circumstances. And this chapter um, gets into just what was going on in their lives before he died. In her former life, Claire was a sales rep for ThyssenKrupp. Her area was elevator technologies and her territory was the Midwest. She liked the job because it involved an endless amount of travel to seemingly anonymous places. She had been to Nebraska 47 times. What was there to see in Nebraska? A surprising amount, really. She knew where to get the best steak in Omaha. When she cut into it, blood pooled on the white plate. She had seen dawn turn the plains as lustrous and vast as an ocean. Once, late at night, she parked her rental car on the side of the road and walked into a cornfield. She stood on a dirt path surrounded by dark stalks and imagined a harrowing chase through the corn that culminated in her murder at the hands of a mass killer with a knife. In the night sky, she spotted the red flash of planes through gossamer clouds, and if she listened very carefully, more carefully than she had listened to anything in months or maybe even in years, she was able to make out the dull roar of their passing. She got back into her rental car and drove away and wondered if this was what people meant when they talked about mindfulness. Early in her career, she learned that one of the most important rules of travel was this. The answer to nearly everything could be found in the signs. This way to baggage claim, this way to the ticket counter, this way to Cleveland, this way to Omaha, this way to the hotel bar. Travel was one of the few arenas in life where clear and correct direction was so readily at hand. Lately, she had been tasked with selling a new kind of cable to find hotels and high-rise office buildings and factories. This cable was made of carbon fiber and allowed elevators to travel twice as fast as they could with steel. They lived in New Scotland, a town on the outskirts of Albany. In their condominium, she kept a small rolling suitcase in the bedroom closet, stocked with miniature toiletries, exercise clothes, an inflatable neck pillow, and the books she brought with her on every flight but could never seem to finish. The Two Faces of January by Patricia Highsmith. It wasn't an especially long novel, but on plane she could only read a few paragraphs before the words filled her with an inexplicable dread, driving the book back down into the depths of her shoulder bag. It was not so much the story that unsettled her, but the hidden things she sensed quivering under the surface. Subtext, she supposed this was called, and she did not care for it. Every time she saw her suitcase in the bedroom closet, tucked behind a mesh laundry bin, she imagined it was waiting for her second secret self. She traveled so frequently it was not uncommon for her to wake in the middle of the night and think for a moment, where am I? She did not find this disconcerting, even when it happened in her own bed, but once she made the mistake of mentioning those midnight thoughts to her husband, and he looked at her like she was terminally ill. The travel had long been a point of contention between them. Why bother being married if you're always leaving? A reasonable question, and she couldn't say that she had an answer beyond the demands of her work. She wanted to be married, and she wanted to leave. The two did not seem mutually exclusive. She had this second secret self that she didn't know how to share with anyone, and when alone, that self came out into the open. In the months before his death, her husband's own secret self started coming out into the open, too. She could only assume this other self had been waiting inside him all along. The year of the great change, he was the same and he was different. The way he looked when his sleep changed, his face used to be smooth and expressionless, almost mask-like, but then one night she found him sleeping with lips parted into a wide, unsettling smile. He switched coffee mugs, trading out the exorcist for the ghoulish face of Michael Myers. 
He was newly skittish around dogs. He stopped adding salt to his food. He stopped eating bananas. His pace on the sidewalk changed. He used to be a brisk, impatient walker, and then one day he began moving so slowly and contemplatively, it was as though every tree branch was a source of wonder. Claire struggled to imagine what 40 years into a life would cause a person to suddenly change the way they walked. There were alien, interminable silences when she called from the road, and when she was home, he took long, solitary strolls in the evening hours, a symptom that would eventually lead to his demise. Another symptom. He started demanding to know what she did on the road, how she accounted for all those hours alone, no matter how many times she told him the simple truth. In a hotel room, her favorite thing in all the world was to switch off every light and everything that made a sound, TV, phone, air conditioner, faucets, and sit naked on the polyester comforter and count the breasts as they left her body. Naked, her husband would shout, as though she had provided him with damning evidence. He had been an angry person for as long as she had known him, but it was a secretive anger. Most people found him loose and lighthearted. Easygoing, that was the word people used, and in time she became suspicious of anyone who could be described in such terms. What was so easy about going? Naked and alone, she would say back. Naked and alone. As a married couple, they'd had perfect years and they'd had shit years, but she had never in her life experienced a year that so thoroughly dismantled her with confusion. On her next trip, she thought about what he would see if he ever were to trail her on the road. A woman marking up sales reports with a pink highlighter. A woman watching workout infomercials with a volume on mute. A woman eating room service quesadillas in the bathtub instead of reading that novel she claimed to be nearly finished with. A woman doing a little exercise routine, squats and sit-ups, bicep curls with bottled waters, completed with the hope that he would notice the smooth lines when he put his hands on her body. A woman breathing naked on the toilet seat, a woman breathing naked in an armchair, a woman breathing naked before the bathroom mirror, in the kind of lighting that could make a person reconsider every choice they had ever made in life. <laughs> a woman breathing naked in the dark. Torture the women, Hitchcock was reported to have said when a young director asked him for advice. Before Richard submitted his papers for publication, he asked her to read them aloud. That was how she became familiar with his theories. They would sit together at the kitchen table, an amber finger of whiskey in mismatched juice glasses, and he would take notes while she read. She learned about final girls, those lone female survivors in terrible places. The wilderness hut of Jason Voorhees, where he stored the mummified head of his mother. The subterranean slaughterhouse in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. In the terrible place, the most hideous part of the nightmare unfolded. In the terrible place, the killer and the final girl were forced into their ultimate confrontation. The papers were very long, and sometimes it would take hours for her to finish. She tried to concentrate on every word, feel the shape of each syllable in her mouth. Claire understood this tradition might have appeared strange or even sinister to outsiders, but she prized the chance to build together a sublanguage that ran invisible and untranslatable under the surface of the world. Claire never did have an affair on the road, but she did accumulate a lot of odd secrets. Excuse me, she did accumulate a lot of secrets, though the secrets are odd. A lot of secrets about the odd things she had heard and seen. There were the dentures she discovered in the back pocket on a flight to Toledo, later removed by a flight attendant wearing blue rubber gloves. People, the flight attendant said, the imposter teeth suspended between her fingers. The Midwestern hotels that could have belonged to a horror set with their fluorescent hallways in lurching elevators and the eerie rattle of the ice machine in the middle of the night. The phone that rang on the hour in Wichita when she picked up, no one was on the line. The receptionist in Cincinnati who told Claire that once a woman fell into such a deep sleep in this hotel room, she never woke up. She didn't die, the receptionist clarified, slipping a room key into its little envelope, but went into some kind of coma and was taken out on a stretcher to a hospital somewhere and would likely be in this hospital for the rest of her life on account of her having never woken up. I don't think that story is good for business, Claire said as she took her room key. The receptionist shrugged. 
The name tag pinned to her blouse read Samantha. The more Claire looked at the tag, the more she got the uneasy feeling that Samantha was not her real name. Some people think it's the best story they ever heard. Samantha, not Samantha, said. The very strangest thing happened in a hotel room in Omaha in her beloved state of Nebraska. She opened the bedside drawer and next to the King James Bible lay a fingernail, so small that it could have only belonged to a pinky, but fully intact and flawless in its shape. Her first impulse was to pick up the nail and swallow it. A thought so startling, she slammed the drawer shut and turned on the TV and tried to watch an episode of Law & Order in which a man was suspected of killing both his first and second wives. Even though the cops found hard evidence, the killer ended up going free on a legal technicality and marrying for the third time. She couldn't forget about the fingernail. She fell asleep with the drawer open, and all through the night she would wake up and turn on the bedside lamp and peer down at the nail. The light gave it a pearly translucence, made it look like a precious thing on display. In hotels, she tried to be a respectful guest. Before leaving, she closed all the drawers and piled up the towels in the bathroom and recycled the paper coffee cups, but that morning she found she could not close the bedside drawer, could not seal the nail up in darkness again. As she wheeled her suitcase into the carpeted hall, she wondered what kind of person would abandon to a hotel room drawer such a perfect specimen of their existence. She was three days back from a trip when her husband was struck by the car and killed. Her flight had landed in Albany at midnight, and when she returned to their condominium, she took a steaming hot shower and ate ice cubes in front of the TV. She fell asleep on the living room carpet in a net of fluorescence, and when she woke in the morning, he had left for school. She changed and drove to her office on Lake Street. She rode a sleek, fast elevator to the 13th floor. She had a tuna fish sandwich at her desk. The afternoon brought a brief driving rain. There's something I want to tell you, her husband said that evening before he left for his walk. He had the lanky build of a track runner, though she had only ever seen him run to catch a train. His hair was a honeyed blonde, faded to corn silk at the temples. He was holding a yellow parka. His turtleneck was tucked in a little too tight. She noticed he was wearing the braided leather belt that had belonged to his brother. She had no idea where he went or what he thought about. Instead, she respected his privacy, his desire for whatever solitary strangeness he was seeking, though later it would occur to her that maybe she had misjudged the situation and solitude wasn't what he wanted at all. Maybe he had been waiting for her to take an interest, inquire about his route, ask if he wanted company. In the months before his accident, she imagined he must have sensed himself plummeting towards some kind of end, must have felt the clawing panic that hits when you sense a part of your life is about to break off and drift away like an ice floe. Who are you? They always seem to be whispering to each other in this peculiar middle passage of their lives. What are you becoming? Neither of them had any idea he was on the edge of losing it all. She said, tell away, my love. She had just finished lining up travel toiletries on the kitchen counter to take stock of what needed replenishing. There was a tiny lipstick and a tiny soap and a tiny razor. You came out of nowhere, asleep in front of the TV. He pointed at the living room carpet as though she had just gotten up. For the last year, his expressions had suggested he was thinking deeply about a problem he could not share. When I first came out and saw you there, it looked like you were unconscious. You scared me. She uncapped the lipstick, stared down at the crimson nub. She could hear the lurking anger in his voice, hidden but no less deadly. I was unconscious, she said. It's called being asleep. Claire, he said, we need to talk. She put her hands on her hips. She stared down at her toiletries. About what? She told herself that she was not unwilling. A door slammed. She looked up and found that he had left the room. That night, he came back from his walk. The following night, he did not. Two hours passed, and she got a phone call from Memorial, and when she got there, he was in surgery, and when the surgeon came out to see her, he was dead. Hit and run, catastrophic internal bleeding. In the waiting room, a TV was mounted on the wall, and talk show hosts were playing golf on a miniature green. A man in a suit sank a white ball, and the studio audience cheered. Scientists had discovered a planet believed to be larger than Earth. 
A skull was found in a grocery in LA posed among the lettuces. Robots were being trained to read human minds. On the intercom, a doctor was being paged. Claire couldn't understand the surgeon. The bright white floor rumbled underneath her. She wanted to demand all these noises be stopped. He fought hard, the surgeon said, and for a moment she hallucinated him, adding, but he was no final girl. That one call from Memorial led to a succession of calls to her husband's parents in Arizona, to her own parents in Florida. Her mother had flourished in old age. She gardened and water skied. She fostered American bobtails and had taken to calling herself a cat fancier. At the time of Richard's funeral, they had four bobtails living with them in Jacksonville. Her father had no say in this cat fancying because the unalterable side of dementia had transformed him into a furious, bewildered stranger. His own father had died from the same disease with the same cruelly rapid onset. The end had been encoded inside him all along. There were no siblings to call. She was an only child and her husband's older brother had committed suicide by leaving from a bridge in California at 34. After her husband got that call, he wept through the night in their bed and she held him as tightly as she could. Looking back, she supposed that had been one miracle of their marriage. Even if a person was on the brink of swallowing fingernails and the other was thinking deeply about a problem they could not share, there was still someone to hold you as you wept through the night. At the funeral, they kept the casket closed, the polished dome heaped with lilies, and instead of sobbing, she vomited before the service and after, over and over into the funeral home toilet, even though she hadn't eaten a proper meal in days. She kept seeing flashes from pregnancy possession horror, Mia Farrow eating raw chicken livers in Rosemary's baby. She felt like someone had carved her heart out of her chest and then turned her loose to stumble through a dark forest on a frigid night. I was here, and now I'm going there. Where? As a child, her father had read her the death of Ivan Ilyich, and those words bloomed in her mind like a miserable flower. Where was her husband now? Where was that where? After the service, she wandered her own condo, vaguely aware that her dress was crooked, and her hair was tangled, and her skin was pale and hot and gleaming, like she had been standing in front of a vegetable mister. There was a long run in her pantyhose, and her breath stank. Her mother had cornered her father in the living room and was trying to feed him coffee cake, her pants feathered with cat hair. A month after her father's diagnosis, in the frozen middle of February, he had called Claire late one night. He'd answered in a hotel room in Omaha, standing in front of the TV in a t-shirt and socked feet. He told her that no one got through life without committing at least one unforgivable act, and what he said next left her unable to speak in anything but sentence fragments for days, a new broken language to cold. Her mother-in-law, now sunless, kept handing her plastic glasses of sweet white wine, which she kept abandoning on tables and counters. Her mother-in-law had insisted on a catered gathering, and now a waiter with a blonde mustache was delivering her a butter cookie on a paper napkin with a slight bow, as though she was some kind of honored guest. Do you have a blowtorch, she wanted to ask her mother-in-law? Do you have any ketamine? Claire had a feeling her mother-in-law wished she would be a more graceful widow, that she would squeeze hands and kiss cheeks and thank people for their flowers and condolence cards and phone calls and prayers, even though the offer of prayer could be seen as adversarial if the offering was not, in fact, religious. People who allegedly knew her kept resting hands on her shoulders and, in low, careful voices, asking about her plans. Would she like to take a walk or a yoga class or go see a movie? A movie. Would it be helpful if they brought over a casserole? For days, she'd been staying up all night watching Richard's extensive collection of horror movies, and by then, every parking lot and alleyway and kitchen looked like an ideal place to be murdered. What in the fuck are you talking about? Seemed like the only rational response to these people who allegedly knew her. Or, in a horror movie, you would be the first to be killed. You are that fucking dumb. I'm going, she kept hearing herself say, I'm gone. And I'll stop there. <laughs>